Okay. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. Oh, season ball. Throw it on the barrel. Vintage baseball podcast talking to Small Fox, Rudy Frias, and vintage baseball players all over this country, border to border, coast to coast. We are here. It's season four. Rudy Frias, are you excited? I am so excited. I finally i am joining like a full season at the beginning. I'm so happy. Oh, my God. Yeah, we'll break up by the end, right? <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be tragic. <laughs> So uh, season four, later on, in just a little bit, we got a couple of gentlemen coming in from the Riverside Smudge Pots uh, from California, 1886 Vintage Baseball, which I'm very excited about myself right now, seeing how I'm putting together something for 2024. Uh, by the way, uh, there's a there's a rumor that I'm on a city council docket tomorrow. Kind of a big day. Can't tell you what it's for, you know, because when they say no, I don't want everyone to be like, ha ha, you know, but I'm on a docket. Uh, hey, Rudy, uh, first episode of season four, we're going to talk about, I'm in a new studio, by the way, you can't see it, but I can, and uh, I can see things and there's not like a, an old mattress and a microwave and <laughs> And all kinds of stuff in my way. It's now fully purposed for the podcast. And uh, so I like that. I'm getting used to a different acoustic thing here, but I'll get it figured out because I'm really good with technology. Rudy, we're going to talk for a few minutes about what we're doing this season uh, before we get in with the uh, the smudge pots. I know what a smudge pot is, by the way, Rudy. I looked it up. Oh, good. Uh, before be we get into it. Uh, R-O-T-B wise R-O-T-B Come on baby say you love me Five, six, seven times uh, Yes uh, I wanted to ask you uh, About something un that unfortunately Happened this week and that was a Former Columbus Capitol By the name of Sundial who passed Away I don't know anything about The gentleman so I'd like to give you The floor for a couple of minutes for you To uh, tell us about Sundial Sundial, um, for those who didn't get a chance to meet Sundial, um, Sundial became a, a capital thanks to his uh, his his little his little sister Kirsten Wyckoff, who is our uh, our tally keeper, our one of three cranks that come to every capital game, um, and I think in the post it stated that he joined the Capitals at a pivotal time, and it, it's very true. Um, you know, we, we weren't having a lot of games, uh, back in the early 2000, mid 2000 area. And, um, we were just kind of a thrown together club and it was whoever my, my brothers, my dad and, and Mike Wyckoff could find to bring on. And he sundial was, uh, he achieved the name and the moniker sundial for his, uh, speed or lack thereof. And he was just a really great guy. Uh, really gravitated to the game. And uh, in the sense that he loved his family and he loved the, the community that uh, the Capitals were developing. And he loved to have a good time. He, we could always, uh, he, he, his, his laugh filled the ballpark. He uh, really I mean, I I could go on forever about talking about how what a great guy he was and how important he was to the Capitals in those early years. Um, moved moved away, uh, moved to uh, out of state, and uh, still remained a Capital at heart. He would always call. He loved the World Tournament of Vintage Baseball and was a part of the very first club to ever win anything for the Capitals at the World Tournament. Um, and every every August, he would call and get updates from Kirsten during the weekend, asking how we were doing and how and it never failed every time, every year. Um, and yeah, he will be he'll be he lost his uh his battle to cancer, and 
he will be missed by many people. So, yeah, thanks, thanks for allowing me to give a chance to talk about him. I know Mike and Kirsten uh, uh, would appreciate it as well. Uh, well, absolutely, vintage baseball. Uh, one of the things that you and I have in common is we think it should be treated as a big family. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we do what we can to keep it that way. So totally. when when the vintage baseball community loses uh, a family member, it's important for us to know and learn about that family member so the legacy can, can last a while in vintage baseball. And uh, I know I don't get to everybody on here. I know people pass away all the time, unfortunately, and the reality of this, this crazy world that we live in. And, mm-hmm. Uh, but I do what I can. Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> uh, yeah. And how do you segue from that into, Hey, let's, uh, let's stop talking about cancer and talk about vintage baseball. Awkward well, transition. No, I got you. Right the transition <laughs> is, is that, uh, uh, through this, through this sad, unfortunate thing, I've been able to go back into the Capitol archives of photos and videos and, and you know, just to to pull for Mike and Kirsten, and um, you talked about what the season's coming up for the Roller Out the Barrel show, and I was really excited about all of the uh, times that we're going to be together with audio, with cameras, and putting together uh, this this vintage baseball spectacle for many many people to see. I'm very excited about that. Oh yeah, uh, we don't even know what we're gonna be doing. <laughs> we just know what we're gonna be trying, which yeah. is which is cool enough. Uh, we start out this season together. The first time we're together is May sixth at the Flat Rock Invitational, mm-hmm. and uh, we're gonna be trying some things there that weekend. And uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> see how that turns out. Uh, I do know that. Uh, we're going to have two cameras and I don't know what the hell we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing as much as we can without we're looking gonna stupid. We're going to spoil ourselves because we'll have three cameras. I'm, I'm, oh my goodness. Yeah. So watch out. It's going to be intense. So, uh, yeah. And we don't, and that's going to be our big learning uh, day as yep. to what we can and can't do should or shouldn't do moving (laughs) forward uh that'll be very interesting i think uh rudy if i'm not mistaken we're not together again until the akron cup in july the 8th and 9th uh yep yep and then we'll be trying some more nonsense but also we're putting on the 2023 mightiest striker and gingerly gentleman contests at the akron cup and uh dude those guys from akron the black stockings have been so awesome uh, to deal with. Uh, what a what a treasure in the Ohio vintage baseball community that those guys are. And the Stan Hewitt Gardens, how is that event not booked full years in advance? They still have two spots, I think. I don't know how it's possible. It is. It is I, I did I, outdoor I theater did outdoor there theater. for a summer and played vintage baseball. That weekend, left the parking lot, walked to the back where the gardens are, and did two shows. It is so gorgeous. I have no idea. I mean, the the Black Stockings, you're right. They're a treasure, and their home field is a gem of the community. So we'll be uh, doing stuff on the main field uh, there. And then um, I'm... uh, Rudy and I are breaking up for a little while during the summer this time. Uh, the world's the world's tournament in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, Rudy's flying solo. Well, he won't be solo. I'm sure he'll have something figured out by then. But <laughs> Rudy's attending the world's tournament as a captain, as a player, and as the roller around the barrel show. Um, I'm sure he's going to have to get some help and, and all that stuff. But I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to be there. I might be there as a fan on the 12th as I look at the schedule because I'm going to be in Detroit on the 12th uh, as I'm flying out 
uh, early in the morning to Boston because I got to get in early because when you're uh, sitting around watching the teams that haven't gotten knocked out of that tournament, I'm going to be at Fenway Park watching the Red Sox and the Tigers. That's really Drunk, awesome. I hope. That's really awesome. Uh, but yeah, I might stop in, but I'm not working on the 12th. So I, don't know. So I am therefore at the Rocky Point Vintage Baseball Festival uh, that's happening on the uh, that following weekend. So that's the, what, the 19th and 20th? Eight, the 18th, 19th, and 20th. I don't know what happens on the 18th. I'll be there for the 18th and 19th. I'm flying back Sunday morning. Uh, and then you have a situation where it's Ohio Cup time, Labor Day weekend. Rudy has no choice but to be there. Uh, he'll never get away from that event. And I'm not going to be there yeah. as of right now. Uh, because I have to pick and choose. So what I did was I gave up Ohio cup. So in two weeks after that, I can make a trip down to Tennessee for the sulfur Dell cup, which is what I'm, which I guarantee I'm going to, I 100% committed to that event last year and I'm going to it. And that's all it's, that's all there is. I have to be there. Yeah. I think I'm flying down there driving and, uh, so yeah, so actually we're only together for three dates at this point, uh, but that's about right, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it's a, it's it's spread out over uh, uh, the capital season, so yeah, I think that I think it's I, I think it'll be good. I mean, we don't see each other more than that usually during a season, do we? Uh, I think last season, well, the season before, we saw each other quite a bit. Uh, as you were doing your uh, goodbye farewell tour, and then uh, yeah, last season I think we only saw each other a handful of times. I think we only saw each other two times last year, right? The Michigan Vintage Baseball Festival, all oh, three times. Yep, and then the World Tournament, and then the Ohio Cup. Yep, that's about right. Yes, and uh, so it'll be nice to see each other at some different events. Uh, it'll be nice to see you in Michigan. I've, uh, at the flat rock invitational, that's a lot of, uh, heavy hitters at that, at that event. Yeah. And, uh, tell me what else you have, uh, on the capital schedule for this year. Um, honestly, uh, we have the, uh, the Columbus vintage baseball showcase because for the first time in a long time, all of Three quarters of the the clubs that exist in Columbus are going to get together at Muffin Meadow to play. I think it's um yeah in June, and then you know what we're we're all looking forward to. We're all really looking forward to the Rochester Grangers uh, match in July, um, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the formation of that club. My father is super excited and was telling me all about the individuals that made the initial trip, and and um you know, wanting to hopefully bring uh, a Frius out of retirement to make the trip so we can have the whole family up there for it. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're awfully excited about that. Uh, what do you got for a date on that one? July, uh, what? Was it uh, 22nd? I feel like I said 22nd, and then Feeney corrected me and said it was the 21st. It is July 22nd. I was right. Why are you listening to Feeney? Um, <laughs> I think the Grangers so, might have given him their schedule. They so. gave him the schedule and put 21st on it to him so he didn't show up sucking on <laughs> one of his lollipops watching the game. Uh, good life, Mike. 22nd of July. Mm -hmm. I might make that one. I might make that one. It's going to be a special event. I mean, 25 years of vintage baseball is kind of a big deal. I mean, I love the Grangers. You guys are okay. And <laughs> I love the venue. The venue is the best. Yeah. Uh, any excuse to get down there to that venue. Uh, outstanding. There you go. Okay. Uh, so that's what we're doing this year. Uh, we're going to have some video situations. We're going to go through our, our normal 
season long 32 interviews uh which is what is the definition of a season for this podcast and then we do a lot of little interviews uh, along the way so i mean we're at 180 episodes so at some point we're going to hit 200 episodes we'll have a big show for that i have no idea what and uh, actually my daughter when she made this video she made this video for me the other day about getting ready for season four she asked uh what we were doing for episode 200 and i was like mm. <laughs> interviewing somebody <laughs> i guess should we is it a big deal i don't know. and uh yeah and then at the end of the season we get to sit back and think about all the things we did that didn't work <laughs> and the couple that did <laughs> whatever it's all <laughs> gold the couple that did <laughs> uh don't forget if you know somebody in the vintage baseball community that you would call maybe a character maybe a hidden gem maybe somebody who has interesting storytelling abilities or has an interesting life out of vintage baseball and you think that uh the whole community would be interested in what they do what they have to say and all that stuff go ahead and you can send one of us a slide into our dms and tell us all about this gent or or uh lady <laughs> and we will get to as many as we can uh history says rudy we start off here no problems with guests and then when the season starts uh we start getting like so many requests we have to make this long list and get through that list so we have to stop trying to get people on the show and just follow this list for like three months. And then when vintage baseball season's over, everyone's like, ah, I need a break. And so we fly <laughs> our guests at the end of the season to get, to get to our 32. But, uh, we will see. Um, we are starting off the season right now. Yeah. Cause we're going to bring it. We have just one gentleman or two. Both are here right now. Both are here. Let's bring them in and let's get season four underway, shall we? Here we go. We are bringing in uh, Victor Gomez, the designer, and we're bringing in Chris, the curator, Johnson, the captain of the Riverside Smudge Pots from California, 1886 Vintage Baseball. Uh, when you guys can hear me, let me know. I can hear you. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Can you hear me? Absolutely. I can hear you. Awesome. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. I hear Victor very well. Uh, <laughs> Chris is driving in his car. Oh, look at that mustache. <laughs> hold everything. We're going to hold everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at that mustache. Here we go. We're going to start the interview with this. Chris, I'm going to interview your mustache. <laughs> mustache. Mustache. How have you been friends with Chris Johnson? Who, oh, me? No, I'm talking to mustache. I'm talking I'm <laughs> at, right now, interviewing the mustache on Chris Johnson's My face. Bad. <laughs> Three years. Three years. You've been friends with Chris Johnson for three years. It's odd that you sound just like Chris. Uh, how did you feel the last time that he got rid of you, Mustache? Not very good. Uh, out in the breezes off of the the Pacific Ocean in California, when you don't exist, do you feel helpless, the fact that you cannot help Chris get through the wind <laughs> and the cold off of the Pacific ocean because he treats you so badly and then keeps you around for three years. <laughs> no, I, he can't, he can't get rid of me because that's like half his vintage baseball game. <laughs> yes. Now you're, you're the captain, <laughs> Chris, you're the captain oh. of the Riverside smudge pots. You're a very important person in vintage baseball. And now you can't get rid of the mustache. So it's almost like, oh. He's holding you hostage. You're holding him hostage. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's a hairy situation. Chris, Victor, yeah. Uh, yeah. thanks yeah. for joining us for this interview. Uh, how are you yeah, guys doing? Actually, uh, You're doing fine. Yeah, I'm doing actually, fine. I actually work at a high school, and all the kids, they call me the Monopoly man. They call me the Pringles guy. 
<laughs> all sorts of different mustache nicknames. So because oh, you're bald. Yeah. You're bald. You're just like you're as bald as Rudy Frias, yeah. aren't you? <laughs> uh victor uh yeah. <clears throat> design gomez how are you doing victor i'm doing fine actually uh just uh, this is my uh first day of vacation actually so uh yeah just uh just try to take it easy hopefully waiting for our trip to uh, san luis obispo this weekend so wow. looking forward to it nice victor you're called the designer why did you get that nickname uh, I got the nickname because uh, I was pretty much designing a lot of the team's merch, a lot of the, the smudgy, the logo they have right in the background. I, as you know, it's funny. It's actually, I think it's his birthday today too. So, yeah, we smudgy designed. Yeah, it's smudgy's birthday, I think. It is a birthday. Oh. Really? Yeah, I think this week. Yeah, I think I think it was this weekend. He has his birthday actually. It was the first time I introduced him to the. To the rest of the guys on the on the group chat, as I remember. So I don't know if you can see us in the Zoom, Victor, but my yeah, background can, yeah, is your logo. The, yeah, I can see in the Zoom. Because uh, you uh, you don't have your video turned on for us, so we can uh, we can't make fun of you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Right now, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. In Zoom meetings right now. <laughs> uh, is there currently? Any merch for the Riverside Smudge Pots? Yeah, Chris, I would say, to... yeah, I would say we have. That's like that's our strength is our merch game is pretty strong. So we we have what we call the mer- old merch game. All of our home games, and so we have stuff. We have anything. We have we have soap. <laughs> we have hoodie. We have Raglan baseball shirts. We have hats like the kind of a knockoff hat like we wear. Um, we have keychains. We have pieces. We have Christmas ornaments. Uh, all sorts of stuff. So that's our that, yeah. That's, that's our strength. Yeah. Where uh, where can I send everybody that listens to this episode? Where can I send them to buy some Smudgebot merch? Put on the. Uh, that was breaking up a little bit but it i it, i it did sound like chris said go to the instagram victor uh yeah. do you is that what he said yes he did either the instagram or the facebook page uh yeah so you guys if if you look behind me and see that logo you want you want a shirt you want to, how many guys on the team have a tattoo of Smudgy? <laughs> uh, none whatsoever. Well, yeah. well after we uh, won our first championship, I, re- I recall everyone in the parking lot when we were drinking some beers all said they were going to get one, but they haven't, uh, they haven't done it. I'm still waiting. I, th- I, I think we were hitting the beer pretty hard after we won that title, bro. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> But some some tattoos are really stupid, but this one, that would be cool. Smudgy the tattoo. Some yeah. I think just one person should get it. The MVP of I saw the last <laughs> don't. I saw the video on your Facebook page of the last don't when you pressed line. Not not when you lost to them. I'm not talking about when you lost. You guys lost. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about two years ago when you won. I saw the last out on that video. Uh, do you guys like post videos of full games? Yeah, so we've streamed a few games live, and then we'll set up about four different cameras, like one behind the plate, one from center field, and then we'll switch cameras. It's kind of hard to do. Like I'm trying to control it while I'm playing, <laughs> so it gets a little tricky. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll do that sometimes, and we'll just record. Because the video presentation looked pretty good, uh, Victor. Yeah. yeah. Do you 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 have a lot to do with uh, designing? Obviously, do you have anything to do with the video output situation? Not, not really. Just the uh, the only thing I have my input is just when uh, Chris puts the logos of the of the, of the club in in there. That's pretty much it. Um, the the audio visual side, I I give that to Chris. He He's the one that does that, and I'm like, I 
like I said, they're in game time. It's it's just uh, I'm more focused on the game if anything, you know. So yeah, it's hard. It's hard as a person who does a videography and tries to captain and play a vintage baseball yeah. game. It's it's damn near impossible. So my hat goes off yeah. to you, Chris. Uh, Thank you. I did. I did want to like because it seems like you guys already are like ahead of the game as far as like merch and design and getting the name out there and and posting live streaming matches. Uh, for our listeners out there, what's the history of the Smudge Pots? When did this club come into existence, and how long have you been associated with it? Either one of you can take that. Yeah, so the Smudge Pots came about in 2018. Uh, I was looking to join a vintage baseball team, and then uh, Crestline told me that they didn't have enough, you know, they didn't have any room on their team. And then the commissioner at the time, Wes Barca, said, Hey, why don't you just start a Riverside team? So I called my friend, uh, John Magdaleno, up and said, Hey, are you, are you down or what? And so we started a team, and I just started calling everyone I played baseball with in my life. And it was kind of a hard sell at the time just because they didn't see any uniforms. Uh, they couldn't, you know, see the vision. But once we got uniforms and started playing now, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people contact us and want to join the team. Well, Victor, well, like, did you did you come about in like 2018, 2019? Or is this uh, newer for you? Actually, I came around 2018. Um, this is funny, though. Around the time I was... Uh, I was actually living. I was actually living around Lake Elsinore, around, and I remember like around that time, I saw like some videos on YouTube about these guys playing vintage baseball in the East Coast, right there, like in Connecticut, somewhere like in New Hampshire, I guess Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I remember I told my ex-wife, I was like, you know what? That's on my bucket list. I would totally like to do that if that if it ever came an opportunity. If there was ever an opportunity for me to uh, play or participate. If there's a league around the West Coast here in this in this area, I will totally do it. And she was in full support of it. And uh, maybe like I want to say like two or three months later, um, I saw the Facebook post. At, at that time, I was running another. I was running a Facebook page. I was running uh, a Facebook page on the uh, San Bernardino Spirit, the old uh, San Bernardino minor league team. They used to they used to go by the Spirit name here in, in, in the area where I live at. And then I saw that. Uh, I saw that announcement there to look for tryouts. And I'm like, you know, I have a little bit of a softball background myself. You know, I played a little bit of uh, freshman baseball. I had a cup of coffee with the JV, so not the varsity, <laughs> you know. So I, I ended up joining it. So I, I tried out. I think the first – I remember the first tryout, it was so hot. It was around August, I remember. And I got to meet Chris. I got to meet John. Uh, I think Peacock was there, uh, Carlos. And I got to meet Wes – Wes and uh, one of his other guys that was I forgot his name. He's no longer with the team though. But but we got uh, I guess I guess the way it went is well since you're the first ones here you're automatically in the team. <laughs> <laughs> that was gonna be that was gonna be my follow up. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Like for the smudge, what's 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 this, what's the what's what's the protocol for a tryout? <laughs> uh, you, yeah, you you show up and you take some grounders with the. You know, with a minimal glove, and you swing a heavy bat, and if you're down to uh, continue, then you made the team. So, <laughs> dope. No offense, no offense to anyone, but uh, yeah, that's how it went. <laughs> uh, Victor, I thought you were going to say yeah. that your ex-wife was not supportive of the vintage baseball, so you divorced her. Um, she, no, uh, he, no, she was supportive, and then. Uh, Let's just say uh, uh, things didn't work out. That's another story for another time. So. <laughs> That's a different podcast. Uh, Beard uh, Victor has uh, joined the, the video portion. Of the um, it is impressive, especially having that hot uh, California heat. It's a dry heat. Uh, you ever think about shaving that thing off? To be honest, I have not it shaved it in over, what, three, four years, give or take? Nice. Yeah, it's a it's a chick magnet, bro. <laughs> I, just, you know, I, I mean, a, this is this is a beard, man. <laughs> this is clearly an audio medium here, but folks, once this gets dropped on YouTube, get to the channel <laughs> so you can see the facial hair that the smudge pots are bringing to the game. It is uh, who they've set the bar very high. 
Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, do you guys think that maybe the next time that you're in the finals, maybe against Crestline, who knows, you guys could have a hair versus hair match where the other team just gets to <laughs> shave all your facial hair? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the guys on Crestline, I don't think, really have too much going on when it comes to facial hair. But uh, we used to do a beard or facial hair or beard in the game. And uh, we'd give out like a little care pack from one of our sponsors yeah. as they like beer, beard products. So. That, was, that was fun. That's, that's genius, honestly. Like the fact that <laughs> like I don't see more vintage teams trying to like reach out for sponsorships from like barbershops and stuff like that. Yeah. Like be the exclusive barber of your vintage baseball club. That's That's where it's at. Well, you know, yeah, what? The, the sorry, sorry to interrupt, Chris. Um, the one, the one thing that we've, um, I have a little bit of a promoting background. I used to promote a lot of rockabilly and psychobilly shows. So, uh, the one thing that I've learned about promoting is, uh, good, there's always good publicity. There's always publicity. You know, it's always, uh, it's important to have publicity when you're trying to promote something. You know, and uh, I think when it comes to I think we've had barber shops. Think- we've had we had um, we had grooming companies hit us up actually. Nice, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about this. Uh, I, I was looking on the team's uh, Facebook page, and I came across a picture of a jug band. Do you guys have your own jug band, or is it a bunch of guys that show up and <laughs> and do the jugs? Yeah. What's the situation? Yeah. So the crazy thing is, is the Jug Band is their name is also the Smudge Pot. So uh, we came across them. They're from Redlands, and so they, you know, they play jugs and washboards and all that fun stuff. But they, we found them on Instagram, and I was just going through some hashtags, and then they've performed actually at our matches two times, and then we've been over to one of their conquer- concerts. So, yeah, we, we don't play, but, uh, yeah, they've come to a few uh, matches. They kind of created the event and brought some, uh, you know, more of uh, some some life to it. Chris, can you take a second and tell everybody exactly what a smudge pot is? Okay, so for, for those of you on the, maybe on the East Coast, over in California, California, especially Riverside, is known for its citrus industry. Riverside was the richest city per capita in the late 1800s uh, due to this orange industry. But they had their um, one winter right around like 1908, they had a huge freeze that froze the, the crops. And so the smudge pot was developed and it would be lit. Uh, so they'd have smudgies that would go and light the heaters and then they would keep the groves warm overnight but it brought all this soot and pollution to the valley. And so they were outlawed by the sixties, but then all these smudge pots were abandoned, thrown away for trash. But now they've seen this revival as far as like, you know, like lawn and garden art, mailboxes are made out of smudge pots. So when we were trying to come up with a name for the team, I thought it was kind of quirky and it was perfect for the area. So I think that's why the community really gravitated towards it. And, uh, I guess the rest is history. What does the citrus industry do now that they don't do smudge potting? Uh, It's still there. Uh, Riverside has the California State Historical Citrus Park. Uh, We're actually going to be part of their citrus tasting event in a month or so. Um, UC Riverside, which is pretty close to where we're at, uh, they have a citrus experimental station still and so they still have some citrus and have you ever ate one of those real small oranges the cutie that was developed at a ucr i believe so it's still kind of there that is awesome uh victor do you have one of these smudge pots in your front yard you know what um i was actually trying to get one the other day those things are pretty darn expensive let me tell you i just pulled them up on i was like i wanted to see one and like Uh, Four hundred and seventy dollars. Like I said, I was like, like I said, Rudy. Dang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They like I'm telling you, these things were junk a few years back. Yeah. And then now, now people are taking them like when they go out 
camping, RVing, and they light them up. There's a whole guy on uh, yeah. Instagram that just sells smudge pots just for those purposes. So. Have them for a bonfire, man. Yeah. Especially those cold Midwest, those yeah, cold right. Midwest winters, you know. Yeah. Uh, I read a story that there was actually a guy going around stealing a bunch of these smudge pots, and it was a big deal because he stole so many of them. Are you guys familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah did yeah. did it have my pic? Did it have my picture on the, on the story? <laughs> that was me. I hope it didn't have my picture. <laughs> it's it's funny because yeah, I I know that story you're talking about. So behind UC Riverside, they have a pile, like I'm talking like 500, and that's where he was stealing them from. But I always thought about, I entertained, I entertained that uh, that possibility of kind of liberating some smudge pots myself. So <laughs> under the cover yeah. of darkness, yeah, <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah. Many smudge pot questions. I have another one. What is used in a smudge pot as fuel if it's burning? If it's burning a, a fire to, to keep the crops warm, what is the fuel? It's like some mixture of some type of kerosene. The the guy that sells them online, I'm like, hey, how do you like these things? And he told me, he's like, yeah, you get some paper towels, you get a bunch of like gasoline and all sorts of stuff. But um, as far as to keep it going through the whole night, yeah, some something to that effect. But it, yeah, like I said, it was pretty bad, and uh, you know they outlawed they outlawed them. So, man. Uh, hey, uh, Victor, tell me about yeah. the Central Classic that's coming up this weekend. Uh well, it's uh, it's going to be uh, four teams, uh, ourselves and our our rival Crestline uh, Highlanders, taking on the uh, Barbary Coast and the San Francisco Pelicans. So we're going to be playing each team once. It's going to well, they're going to play one Saturday, one Sunday. Um, it's kind of like a kind of like a goodwill game in a way. Maybe there'll be, hopefully there'll be a California championship, state championships. You know. Okay. We would like to see uh, maybe San Luis Obispo as a center, Is maybe it, home of that championship game. That'd be pretty cool. You know. Are you guys that's... meeting in the field halfway in between each other? Uh yeah, we're at the, it's I think for both of us, it's like a three hour drive from where we live at, from where they live at. That's... I think this was my idea, Rudy. If we go back in the archives of the Royal Earl the Barrel Show, I interviewed two of the Pelicans. I think I can take credit for this idea. It should be called the Barrel Classic. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Yeah, that, is this is this the first year for it? Is this the first year of this classic? Yeah, it's the first time uh, the Bay Area teams uh, reached out and they've done an amazing job, um, kind of promoting it and securing the venue. They even got a they even got a local brewery that has really no skin in the game at all uh, to sponsor the field and everything. So. Wow, that's that's pretty that's pretty amazing. That I mean, and and Bear Roller, I will back you up on this. This was um, while it might not be initially your idea, you did uh, verbalize it for uh, tens of tens of people to hear on the podcast. So, uh, congratulations, Bear Roller. My good in the Barrel Roller Classic this weekend. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> Victor, uh, you mentioned the Rockabilly stuff. It's a neighbor. It's a neighbor. My bad. My bad. Does your neighbor have a smudge pot? No, your my neighbor does not have a smudge pot, but we got, <laughs> but I got an orange tree here in my front yard. My bad. I was about to say, are you walking by an orange tree? Dang. Yeah. No, okay. no. I have one in my I have one in my front yard actually. Yeah, that'd be nice. I have one in my front yard. That'll be a good background, actually. <laughs> uh Victor, those Hello? rockabilly posters, were you making those? You froze. Yo, there, there he is. I'm back. There Sorry. I'm back. Sorry. 
All right. Talk to me about this rockabilly lifestyle that you were leading and why you don't anymore. Uh, you know what? I'll be honest with you. It's, uh, it's a long story. You know, uh, you know, I will help bands get gigs, help promoters get 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 a hold of it. Uh, I was always the middleman in a way. Uh, just came to the point when I got kind of burned out. You know, oh yeah, so and so's performing there. Well, performing there. You know, I, I've you know I've seen them so many times. So, what's the point of watching them? You know, you know. <laughs> so, uh, I got burned out, and I just decided oh, I don't want to be part of it anymore. I'm just I got tired of it, got done, and just wanted to focus on something else. And then this showed up. So, heck yeah, variety is the spice of life. It comes up on yeah. the show. I have a question. Yeah. Billy Bob Thornton, any good? <laughs> Billy Bob Thornton, any good? Uh, no, I don't think I've seen him actually. Uh, nobody ever has seen him. Yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> Chris, uh, when you're dealing with 1886 baseball, as we go back into vintage baseball, uh, you're dealing with minimal equipment. You're dealing with, uh, I know that you guys out in California will uh, perhaps take a little bit of liberty with the catcher's glove uh, for a little bit extra protection. Uh, what else? Uh, tell everybody uh, 1886 rules, the equipment that you are using. Yeah, so we're a little bit different than kind of Civil War era ball. Uh, we do get to wear the glove. Uh, the glove is really minimal. It's a little bit more than like a gardener's glove, like a work glove. And the bats are 35 inches uh, minimum and 40 ounces minimum. Uh, and so uh, unlike, but we also are throwing overhand. Uh, some guys are throwing in the high 70s, low 80s. So, like you said, with that with that catcher's glove, we do make a little – we take some liberty and kind of, you know, <laughs> give it a little bit more padding. It's still a turn-of-the-century kind of glove. It doesn't have a web or anything. Uh, we don't wear helmets, obviously. Um, but it's not underhand. It's overhand. And so it's a little bit more in line with modern-day baseball rules. Um, but it still has that vintage appeal. 1886 is that kind of that watershed moment because of the use of gloves and, you know, the overhand. So. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Rudy. It looks like. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I have, uh, it's, it's very it's interesting. Um, like you, uh, barrel roller might have uh, mentioned, we we've interviewed a few people from, uh, uh, the West coast. Uh, and I've heard it mentioned Crestline. There's a rivalry. Um, has that always been a rivalry or is that a new thing? And did that rivalry develop over time in championship matches or something? Could you talk about the genesis of that? Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on that. So uh, the first time we played Crestline, Crestline was kind of the premier team of the league. And we played a scrimmage game right when we first formed. And I think they beat us somewhat than like 25 to 2. So we just got destroyed. I think we like evaluated whether or not we should be even playing in the league. And uh, we practice every, uh, every weekend. And even in our first season, we lost to them twice. One game was really close and uh, uh, controversial. It was covered by the local newspaper. Uh, we lost and it was uh, – something that really weighed on us. And then all of a sudden we found our way into the championship. We, we don't even know how, but we played cross line and we, we were kind of like the David, you know, sliding uh, Goliath. And so that's kind of the, the birth of the, the rivalry. And then the next year we, um, after COVID, we were able to, you know, play them again and beat them again. So I think they were, it was a huge upset and um, they were able to, you know, squeak, squeak past us this year and, and gain the championship. So for the first three championships in our league have been either us or Crestline. So I think that's kind of the genesis of the rivalry. Nice. Rivalry started the second they told you they didn't have any room on their roster. I was about to, thank you. You took the words <laughs> yeah. right out of my mouth. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you you know what? That is where it started. You know what? And, and with all due respect to Joe Bilheimer, the Ripper, and Chris Dodd, uh, with all due respect to them, I know they say it was satisfying that they beat us this uh, this past year, but it was extremely satisfying 
beating them twice <laughs> the first two years, and I got two rigs to prove it. So I'm pretty happy <laughs> about that. Well, that's history. Most recently, you lost, Victor. So <laughs> don't. I got two. I got. I got two. On you. I got two over them. So it's cool with me. <laughs> It sounds like you guys are going to be fighting for for many years to come in the future. Uh, have Have you seen an uptick in interest in the vintage baseball in the area? Like, are you expecting there to be growth in what you're doing, or are you just more concentrating on making sure your rosters are full for what you currently have? Yeah, I think there's a lot of growth and interest. It's starting to really hit the like greater Los Angeles area. The LA Times did a really nice feature on our league last year. So as far as media growth, um, you hear talk like, even though, you know, we're not the best, you know, we had to put together a team of people from Riverside. We're not the, you know, the strongest team out there. Um, but people are really gravitating to that vintage game. And like, if you run into somebody around town, you start talking about it. They've heard about it. And uh, even like other cities are trying to come into the league. We're adding Anaheim. This year and you know Anaheim's a perfect lo location with a you know major league club as well so there's a lot of talk and it seems like people are starting to kind of hit up the league and they want to join a they want to join the club so and I think they're just looking for something especially after you know how how hectic this world is with technology just to kind of get into something a little bit different and maybe uh, uh, an 1886 club in Anaheim will give them something more to be excited about than uh, a couple of overrated <laughs> players. Hey, uh, oh, Victor. Gosh. Oh, yeah. man. Here we go. Wow. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an Angels fan. Wow. Victor's fan. So Victor, Victor appreciated that comment. Well, uh, I'm a Dodger Mike fan, Trout. so. <laughs> Otani and Trout, yeah, they're great. They're great batting practice players. I know. They're great in the regular season. <laughs> Oh God! He told you, bro. He told you. Hot stir. <laughs> Come on, yeah, bro. <laughs> Make the playoffs. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Michael Jordan made the playoffs every year. Uh, Victor, <laughs> yeah, uh, you're a Dodgers fan. Uh, tell me about your fandom for the Los Angeles Dodgers, a team that wins. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? I, I've been a, I've been a fan since I want to say since I was born because my my dad was a huge is a huge Dodger fan and. He first got into this country during around that time when you had the boys of summer of Ron Say and Russell, Lopes, Garvey, Jaeger, Valenzuela, you know. Uh, so I, I have a Maybe. picture. I actually have a picture of when I was a child when, you know, I had my first, my, my Dodger batting helmet with my big orange, my big orange plastic bat, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been a Dodger fan ever since. So I was uh, growing up. I was a huge Kirk Gibson fan. So obviously Gibson went on to the Dodgers and and, yeah. and wins the one World Series game on yeah. two bad knees. But before I was a Kirk Gibson fan, I was actually a California Angels Bobby Gritch fan. Chris Johnson, do you know the name Bobby Gritch when I say that? Yeah, actually, uh, Bobby still works for the team, so they send him out to all these events. Um, I actually run an Angels baseball fan club too, another social media thing. Um, but I gave Bobby this shirt that says Halo Haven, which is the name of our, you know, our social media presence. And uh, he took it. But then a few months later, somebody found one of our shirts at some Goodwill out in Orange County. And it was the shirt that we gave to Bobby. He donated <laughs> it back, like within like a year. And wow. I thought it was kind of cool. I don't know if that's a cool thing. Like when you see your own merch I hit the thrift shop, but um, I, I'm a hundred percent it was Bobby's because he was a two XL, and that was the only one. That, we did like a real limited run of like twenty shirts, so I'm sure Bobby did. But uh, Bobby's a good guy. Um, always down to talk baseball. He has time for the fans. So, yeah, Bobby's always one of, been one of my favorites. Um, probably a borderline Hall of Famer. I think with all the Saber metrics, uh, he could possibly get in someday. Him and like him and Garvey. I think uh, I think he led the league. He tied with three other people to lead the league in home runs one year, and it was only like twenty two home runs. My my my, how <laughs> times have changed. Well, <laughs> they were juicy. They weren't juicing enough. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, a lot about the Angels, actually, because like uh, this week in baseball would always have that Fred Lynn, Brian Downing collision at the wall, catching the, the yeah. fly ball. Uh, yeah, so I have a lot of history of, of knowing the Angels exist, but never watching them and never seeing them in the playoffs. Uh, Rudy. Okay. Okay. You know, <laughs> stop digging that hole. I, uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm intrigued, uh, on this one, uh, for both of y'all because we have two individuals, one who is, you know, designing, uh, elements for the club and, and, and both involved in social media. Um, if you had any tips to give vintage clubs about, uh, putting together social media uh, a post or if they're looking to like put together a merch thing and they need designs, like what, what could you give them some tips or ideas uh, that could get them going? Yeah, I could give them some tips. Uh, you know, you want to improve the logo, you want to design a logo, try to find an artist that uh, give you something, you know, something that they pretty much, I would like to say that somebody that knows that that's passionate about the game, that's passionate about the history, uh, you know, something that will not break the bank because there's a lot of graphic designers there that, yeah, I'll make a logo for you, but I'm going to charge a next amount of dollars for it. You know, it's, and they don't have no, it, there's no, sometimes I'll make something up on the fly and not even care. You know what I mean? And uh, the best thing, you know, find somebody that, that knows what you're talking about. Second, don't hesitate to um, decorate the field. Decorate the field. Prepare the field. You know, put some streamers. Put some banners up. Put something up. Uh, you know, uh, we have the tendency in our – if you've seen pictures on our, of our home games, I actually come an hour or two hours and a half with one of my other teammates, and we set up the banners. We set up the flags. We set up – we actually have those two championship pennants that we hang up at every game. You know, kind of have that realistic theme of a of an actual ballpark, you know, in a way. Of course, we're not charging for entrance. It's free to come in, you know. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, uh, me, uh, social media does help, you know. F you know, uh, just spread the news, spread the word out. That's all I could say. Okay. Uh, notice how Victor it. threw in the two championship <laughs> pennants. <laughs> Look at yeah. I have to rub it in, man. Sorry. The two championship pennants. Uh, that's great. Do you? What did you guys? Uh, I heard you say earlier that you got two rings to prove it. Do you guys actually have rings, or is that just an expression? We no, do have we rings. have no, we have rings. Shut we up. Have rings. Yeah, yeah, f five more, and we're Brady. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> no, we. Uh, yeah, so it's actually kind of crazy. They're making them like out of Indonesia, so the, that's where the artist is. Uh, the first year was a, it was a little bit more crude and like you or like a little rudimentary. Um, you can't really take it out. But the last uh, version was pretty pretty sharp, something that you'd almost see like a class ring. Victor designed it, and um, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty solid. So it's, it's nice to walk in with those two on. Maybe we'll roll them up to the. To yeah. the area again but, oh, um, man. yeah just uh just to kind of go with Vic, what victor was saying uh what are the tips uh, for me i think it's getting involved in the community um going to events like we got to go to the heritage house they do an ice cream social so it's a it's kind of a, a house from the 1800s so we did like a baseball clinic for kids we signed autographs um they were coming up we were signing autographs with, like a feather plume uh, attached to a sharpie um, but things like that just getting people interested in the game showing off the equipment and creating that fan experience at our games um, one our first game we almost had 200 people there and some you know sometimes we have games we're on the road they only have like maybe five um, so it's about you know being more than just playing baseball creating that experience we sell old-fashioned soda um, old fashioned concessions. Uh, we have the first pitch thrown out by, you know, someone, whether it's a local politician, like the mayor, um, we've had a former major leaguer who was on the big red machine, his son's on our team. So, uh, Jim Barrett, if you remember him, 
Uh, and he threw out the first pitch uh, to our first game. So just trying to bring the whole community in, uh, get kids excited about baseball. We have a cannon we shoot off that shoots like swag out into the stands, but it's really like a t-shirt cannon, but we just oh put God. it in the base of a cannon. Just all these little things. Um, yeah. And each year I think we're looking to improve. So I don't know what we're doing this year, but uh, – and we're going to, yeah, we'll, we'll figure something else out to, you know, draw people in. So we're kind of taking like some stuff from minor league baseball, mixing it in with uh, stuff that connects to the city. Um, but I think that's, I think that's where you'll see, you'll find success. So you're doing a, a perfect uh, mix of you've picked a logo and a, and a theme for your club that is near and dear to the community's heart. So you got in through that. So that was genius. Uh, and then all of this other stuff that you guys are doing, even down to the rings. Rudy, I think the Saginaw Old Golds did a ring one year for the yeah. World's Tournament. I saw it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, it comes down to treating, if you don't treat it like it's special, no one else will. And it seems like you guys are going above and beyond uh, to treat it that special. My question is, uh, did Crestline ask you for ring information so they could get theirs? God dang it, Bill Rose. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you I think you the Victor, I'm sure Victor, he has his, Victor like. hasn't said anything, but I'm sure he designed it. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know what, Chris? I don't, I don't want to get any of my teammates bad, which are they're probably going to be bad when we get this. They're going to give me such a rough time this week. <laughs> but I did design their ring actually, so hey, it came out it, pretty nice actually. You do quality work, people are going to reach out Spoiler to you. you know? Spoiler yeah. alert! Yeah, well, Victor, I assume since you designed it that you saw it, right? You've seen yeah, one. I seen it. And was the uh, was the craftsmanship? Did they take another step up? I want to say they did a little bit. They did a, a they did put a, I think they put more like of a pewter finish. And I want to say, okay, on the ring. So it came out pretty good, actually. It's not bad. The only regret I had is uh, they got the once I think they had the same design on both sides. You know, I was okay. waiting for them to give me some sort of a, a something like a model or something like a slogan for that year. You know. But uh, it, it wasn't meant to be, I guess. Well, the, the the team that they beat, it's that's their slogan. They just can't put it. Pretty in much, there. yeah. It, it's just the score, the team, the other team's logo, and that's it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it it it's fascinating for me to hear uh, coming from the Midwest, especially with Barrel Roller, what y'all are doing for a regular season game is the level of detail and uh and attention that will be given to like a huge event. And then like uh, Midwest regular season games are like, no, we'll just show up at this field and we'll play. We're not going to put any accoutrement on it. And then uh, hearing about these rings. I mean, look, I love everything we've ever won, but carrying around these jugs, like, cause we have like, you know, these little like pots that say champion and, and <laughs> various thing at uh, like wooden plaques and things those are cool i mean <laughs> rings sound awesome that's amazing yeah. <laughs> i wanted to ask you guys uh when i did watch this video of uh your guys's last out and your win a couple years ago i noticed and i already knew this ahead of time but i i wanted to bring it up the umpire is standing behind the pitcher uh i don't obviously that's not accurate so tell us the league's decision on putting the umpire behind the pitcher and uh, any, any pitfalls that have come with that. I think, uh, well, the first game I played, um, they had the, the sir, the umpire was kind of at an angle behind home play, but I think it just came down to safety and the willingness and our ability to get <laughs> people that were crazy enough to do that for the foul tips and things like that. And I think the angle that they're at, it was kind of hard to see or call a strike um, or see where the ball's coming. So we moved them behind. So, yeah, you're right. The accuracy is not there. And that might be something that we revisit down the road. But um, that's, that's my best uh, guess as to why we did that. Uh, it looks 
Well, I mean, it's it's overhand baseball, so it's a it's a hard sport. But it kind of looks like the umpire could take one off the noggin if he's not paying attention. Have you run into an issue with the umpires getting hit with the ball? No, I don't. I don't remember seeing anything in one of our games. Um, yeah, not really. Knock on I don't wood. Really think- I can't believe. Yeah, I I actually yeah. umpire. I actually umpired a game when uh, I want to say when uh, Lake uh, Lake Arrowhead and Paris first came into the league, and I was this close getting getting hit uh, right in my stomach. Actually, actually, and and speaking of that, I actually did get hit <laughs> like uh, the the fall the this past season on the same area too, but uh, it wasn't that serious. Um, you just gotta yeah, be think- alert. You just gotta be alert. Yeah. I think the biggest issue is the overhand and then not wearing helmets. I think that's kind of the thing that we worry about the most. The guy got hit in my face one time. My Whoa. nose was bleeding and things like that. But um, I think the accuracy of our pitchers or the hurlers has improved over the time. And then we kind of instituted a, a rule that if you hit so many um, batters that you're you're out for the game. So. Oh. Oh. So yeah, that that brings. I was gonna ask, like, uh, here in the Midwest, like, like for me, like I pretty much play every position at this current time. Like, I'll pitch, I'll catch, oh. I'll do, I'll do everything. Yeah, bear roller. I'm Shoot. I'm tooting my own horn. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, <laughs> I've won a couple of awards. No, uh, but uh, like, with an overhand ones. game, are the positions locked in? Like, do you have guys who're like, nah, you're not gonna. We're not going to put you a pitcher. Like, what's that like when you're fielding the team defensively? Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to finding your pitcher and your catcher. Those guys are pretty locked in. Um, Obviously, nice to have some backups there. But when it comes to the other positions throughout the game, we kind of just, like you said, trade off. Uh, You're like, oh, I don't want to go out there this inning. Hey, go (laughs) out there. So we don't have to, like, we're not really subbing. We're batting the whole lineup. Yeah. And so you're like, oh, I'm going to go play, you know, shortstop. Okay, that's cool. Um, some guys, are like, of course, you have your preference or you, where you feel comfortable at. But, uh, yeah, there's been games where we're almost playing nine positions. Wow. So. Wow. Uh, you know that's not historically accurate, right? Okay. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we uh, – the thing is – is we hear we interview a lot of 1886 clubs from the East Coast. So they they can't pick on the Midwest teams because we don't play 1886 in the Midwest. And uh so they have to travel and take shots at California. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Everyone wants to hate on California. I know. It's all right. No, it's actually it's actually funny. Last year our league assembled uh kind of a team mixed mixed of different teams from our own league, but we went out to Bisbee and played a um played a more civil war kind of era tournament with the underhand and all mm-hmm. that. So that was pretty interesting to see the other side and some of the rules and um I think I thought it was gonna be a little bit easier, but it in some ways it was more difficult. I, I oh, would agree. Yeah. I, I would agree with you one hundred percent. Like because having because I'm in Ohio and barrel rollers in Michigan, so like we only know uh, eighteen sixty four, like bound, and then uh, my club discovered the fly game eighteen sixty eighteen sixty seven in nineteen ninety eight, and so like. It we we don't really differentiate. We don't get out of that box. We stay in that box, and so uh, the thought of playing overhand is amazing. And like you know, twenty years ago, I'd have been all over it. We did play one one or two teams, but those teams faded away quickly because there were no other teams in the area playing yeah. that way. So I'm I'm uh, I know Barrel Roller fell in love with the game uh, when he was at Old Beth Page because it's just a. F- it's a it's a good pace. It's a good pace for a ball game. A lot of action, right, Barrel Roller? It's it's a lot more intense because you got to pay attention. It's not like going out there in '64 when you can play with all your bingo buddies and everybody you go bowling <laughs> with, and, and 
catch everything off a of bounce and be like, hey, hey, I'm having fun. No, you gotta you actually gotta play baseball in 1886. So yeah. uh, that's why I'm trying to get together uh an 1886 league here in Michigan and Ohio for next year, 20, uh 2024, uh trying to do four teams, three events. Uh, starting very small, nice. starting as small as possible, and see where it goes from there. Because there is a lot of interest uh, in the Midwest, but no one, no one's going to do anything about the interest. So somebody, mm-hmm. somebody's got to do something to get some '86 baseball around here. Because it's the most fun right. I've had watching vintage baseball by far. Was watching uh, uh, the Canton Corn Shuckers from Michigan actually traveled to Old Beth Page and played the Bro- the Providence Grays. Mm-hmm. Is that who they played in that match, or was yep. it the Atlantics? No, it's the Providence Grays. Providence Grays. And uh, that's the most fun I've had, and I called that game. Everyone can go back in the archives and, and listen to the play call of that game and listen to me fall in love with 1886 baseball as that game goes on. I just if if it was if 1886 were a woman, I would have left my wife that weekend. It would have been <laughs> Wow. <laughs> no offense. No offense. She doesn't listen. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't listen. <laughs> hey we want to thank you guys uh for taking some time out uh to talk to us about vintage baseball and bobby gritch uh i'm gonna get bobby i'm gonna try to get bobby gritch on the show and get down get to the bottom of this t-shirt uh goodwill situation <laughs> oh, yeah, happy oh, wow <laughs> but uh chris victor you guys are, are great gentlemen you're great ambassadors for the game uh, we over here in the Midwest and the East Coast are watching. We're we're checking you guys out. We're seeing what you guys are doing. Uh, we all love baseball. It's one big family. So I want to uh, thank you guys for uh, coming in. Yeah, and 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 best of luck this weekend as you uh, uh, you and your rivals come together and and to represent and and uh, we look forward to seeing some uh, updates and outcomes and on the social media about that. So. I encourage everybody listening. Go ahead. I already went in. Follow the smudge pots, uh, uh, especially. I mean, honestly, if you just want to look at what a vintage baseball club running a social media page should look like, you go ahead on Facebook and follow them. Follow them on Instagram as well. And uh, you can slide into their DMs and get some merchandise sent to you, which I'm going to do. You're going to see, you're going to see Smudgy on this belly soon enough. <laughs> Uh, thanks thanks you guys rudy stick around don't leave yet but uh, okay. uh chris and uh, victor thanks for joining us you guys have a good night it was a pleasure to meet you guys hey thank, thank you. you it's an honor yeah, we appreciate it thank you yeah. keep up the good work thanks guys keep up the good work guys thank seriously you. good luck at the burrow roller classic <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> oh doesn't it get you excited? Uh, oh my God! Right. I'm I'm so excited right now about uh, season four. I'm so excited about vintage baseball, and now I'm even more excited about this 1886 baseball thing that I'm putting together. I watched their, like I said, I was watching their videos. God, that's just fun baseball. I mean, I understand. No offense. No offense to 64 and 67. <laughs> uh, well, actually, 67 is. Uh, when it's a when it's competitive matches, when yeah. it matters, when it's a tournament or something. I mean, that's just as fun. That's fun baseball. Yeah. Uh, especially when you have pitchers that are uh, uh, above average. True. That really makes that fun. Uh, Sixty four, if it's played the right way, is intense and good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If played by the actual rules, then it, it can be a little more intense and a little more fun. So. But 1886 for a baseball fan, that's the sweet spot right there in vintage baseball. It really is. Uh, and I, and unfortunately, you get to a certain age and you could no longer think about playing 1886 baseball where you can play 64 until you die. So, uh, <laughs> so I guess it's all in personal preferences and everything. Uh, but they really put a lot into it. And uh, they're a very impressive not only are they a very impressive club, but we talked to Crestline and we talked to the San Francisco Pel- Pelicans. It's a very impressive system that they got in California. And they might not have uh, the history down 
the way everybody would like it to be 100% accurate. They've made some changes for them, but whatever. They're they're hitting it. They're doing it right. It's better than it's far- better than not happening at all. Like that's the thing. Right. Like I mean, I'm it like even what they said about the the empire it, it's a safety concern. You got to put that above everything else. You put safety above accuracy all the time. And if you don't uh, shift your priorities, but no, absolutely impressive all around the whole from, from the, the whole area. I heard the word commissioner thrown around. I heard, I mean, like it seems like they've really built and are building a thriving vintage baseball community. And it's uh, it's amazing. And I wonder at what point will those, will those gentlemen playing eighty six on the West Coast, will they age out and just not play anymore, or will they bring the sixty four game to the West Coast when time catches up? Just honestly, watch it. Watch it be what you're doing. Watch it be the reverse of what you're doing, where you're bringing eighty eighty six eighty four into the Midwest. They'll bring 68. They'll be like, all right, 64. They'll be like, okay, guys, we're a little too old to be doing this, but we want to stay involved. Here's our 64 team. Huh? I think it's per- I think it's possible. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, great interview to start off season four next week. Rudy, I don't know if I told you. Did I tell you who, we're, who we got no. next week? Oh, special treat. You are going to be, the smile that's about to come across your face is going to be priceless. Next week, episode two, season four, it's the Mattingly Brothers. (laughs) (laughs) You, that is, oh, that's going to be, oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait. Those two are, oh, trouble. I love it. And also we are going to attempt, if we have enough time, uh, to set up our first game show next week, so that'll be that'll be the warm up is our first game show. So uh, a lot going on for us, uh, Rudy. It was so great to sit down with you again. We're getting back in the flow. Oh, I'm excited! I get goosebumps. Good. It feels good. I can't wait. I mean, because I don't know if you've had the experience up north, but like it's actually kind of been false spring down here. So we've had days of sunshine and close to 70 degrees. And the whole time I'm like, ah, I want to get out there. I'm going to swing a bat. It's that time. I'm getting that itch. And this this is just scratching it. I love this so much. This was a blast. Uh, we're about to get hit with a major snowstorm starting tomorrow night. So, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's major, uh, major, many inches of <laughs> snow and ice. Oh no! Uh, yeah, so I got to work in work in that weather on Wednesday, and then go okay. to work. You be careful out on there. Thursday. Uh, people, people, business owners. Let me. <laughs> Plow your parking lots. A holes. <laughs> and I feel like we need the the more you know <laughs> the, the banner going across the screen. Oh, so many, love it. So many sidewalks and driveways and parking lots and. Uh, it's not fun in the winter being a beer delivery guy, but. Hey, hey, be careful. I do what I got to do. Watch your step. Take your time. You got this. Don't forget, we got Rookie of the Year, the movie discussion coming out at some point over the next month. It's going to happen. I want to get I want to get my movies out of the way. I don't know what Rudy's doing with his. I don't know if he. I don't. He might. He could have already done them for all I know. I don't know what's I'm, going I on. I haven't with that. done them. I'm, I'm I'm building up the suspense. You're 100 percent right. I'm I'm, I'm going to get on this. In this building, and. <laughs> Uh, uh, so we want to thank you guys for sticking around for three seasons as you've done. Uh, we've done some great stuff. You know what, Rudy, before we leave, before I let you go, uh, I'm going to take a second here to look up the current top 10 episodes in pod bean roller girl history. Ooh, there has that. been some movement. movement and want to let everybody 
know where they've been. Moved to. Here we go. Should we? We'll go from one until ten because uh, truly, <laughs> there is no uh, competition for the first episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As uh oh, I'm having a hassle. There it is. The first episode, as always, is is actually the crest line, crest line hill on Highlanders. The Crestline Highlanders, Heritage Cup champions, oh. uh, season three, episode 27, is by far, by far our highest downloaded episode on Podbean. Remember that this is Podbean exclusive. This is not overall. Uh, number two uh, has not changed. That is the Dirty Pirate, Anthony Canino, uh, part one. My favorite. Because we, I think we interviewed him twice. Yep. Uh, episode three. Season, or, uh, number three on the top 10 downloaded episodes on Podbean. Season three, episode 25. Keith Boomer Walters of the, Ro- of the Rochester Grangers with a uh, special guest. It was uh, Michelle. Oh, what was her last name? Not O'Connell. showing up on my list. Yeah, O'Connell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Michelle O'Connell. Uh, good pull, Rudy. I'm old. Uh, gotcha. Of the Maricopa Maidens, right? Yeah. Do I got that right? Yep. I should have put this on ahead of time. I'd have all the information and not look like an ass. Sorry, Michelle. Anyway, <laughs> third uh, was that. Uh, ep- uh, fourth is season one, episode 29. The newly appointed captain of the Saturday Night Old Golds, Jeff and Kicks. Oh, yeah. Holding strong. Boy, he's always been in the top 10. Yeah. Uh, ever since the episode happened. He's a top 10 so, type of guy. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say top 15, but. <laughs> uh, the fifth most downloaded episode, season three, episode 28. You see a trend here. We really hit. We really hit. Uh, our groove uh, together at the end of season three. I was That's so magic yeah. one of the one uh, where I'm like, God, the season's ending and all that stuff, but uh, we've never had this momentum before on the podcast. And now we've ruined it <laughs> by taking our, our season break and then starting back up in season four. We'll see what happens. But uh, season three, episode 28, uh, Paul uh, M- Menser of the Belleville Stags of Missouri. Yep. And then we had uh, in warm up. We had David Blanchard of the uh, Field of Dreams report, which mm-hmm. was a fat segment. If you have not heard, well, for one, Paul was great. Uh, oh gosh! But if yeah. you and uh, but if you want information about the Field of Dreams and what's going on in the future and and all the politics behind what's going on with the Field of Dreams, you gotta listen to the first. Uh, David Blanchard on the Field of Dreams report because you're going to get all the information there. And obviously, people wanted to hear that as well as Paul Menser because it's our fifth most downloaded episode. So in our top five, we have three episodes we did at the end of season three. You see how our momentum was crazy? Yeah. Uh, And then uh, number six is... uh, what could be my favorite episode? I, I, it's one of yours too. It's season two, episode two, uh, Philip Coco Hayes of the favorite episode. Corn Shucker. Yep. Yep. Uh, that is, we get into some, if I remember correctly, we get into some uh, discussions outside of vintage baseball that some people would find awkward. And uh, I did not. And uh, I don't yeah. think Philip either and i think we we told the line and got some information out there and uh i'm pretty proud of that episode actually it's my favorite episode number seven is uh is our roller out to barrel extra number four it's daniel jones and 21st century town ball uh the town ball community really was excited to have that episode and i know that vintage baseballers uh, wanted to learn more about the town ball and what you what you learn about is the history of the town ball and then how they've they've kind of 
changed it to what it would look like today if town ball actually existed instead of baseball. Uh, so that's a very interesting uh, episode if you're looking for the history of town ball. And then number eight, uh, number episodes number eight and number nine are the ones that have fallen due to the increase on the other ones. But mm. what used to be my number one episode is now number eight. It's season one, episode one, Mike Marbles Feeney <laughs> of the Can Gorn Chuckers, our first, first oh. episode that we released. And actually, Rudy was a part of that episode. So it's almost like, you know, it's yeah. almost like we, yeah, COVID killed us, Rudy. Who knows what what would I don't know. I'm pretty happy with the way the podcast is right now, but uh, who knows what would have happened if uh, COVID didn't happen? You know, exactly. Crazy. Uh, in episode, uh, the ninth most downloaded episode is the World Tournament Special number eight. Mike Marbles Feeney uh, goes heel, turns heel on the base of the independence in this episode. <laughs> and uh, Okay. Probably downloaded a lot because of that fact. Well, plus it's Mike Feeney. It's he downloaded a lot. You notice that we we try to squeeze in as much Mike Feeney as we can. I think we've overdone it. Have no. we overdone it? You can't oversaturate okay. the market when it comes to Mike Feeney. Let's be honest. And then our number 10 on the list, uh, season three, episode 13, Jeff Kraut Bamer from the Fillmore Fun Guy of Minnesota. The Fillmore Fun Guy still haven't lost at the Ohio Cup. Is that accurate? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and uh, so there we are. So we're expecting uh, big things in season four, and hopefully we can get some season four episodes into that top ten. Oh, yeah. uh, we did move up. We did move up from number 10 to number nine in the off season of best baseball podcasts, according to, I don't remember. <laughs> it's a blog. Uh, I'm going to look it up for a second. Hey, yeah, the fact that a we're on a list, that's amazing. Yeah, we're on a list. Oh, it's a feed spot. The 25 best baseball history podcasts, uh, we were number 10. We've moved up to number nine. I don't even know what the criteria is, but, you know, anytime I fall on a list, I don't tell anybody. So all the times we fall in, I don't tell Jack Diddley squatness, but I will tell you when we move up and we exactly. move from 10 to nine. <laughs> Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, okay, Rudy, I think we've kept him along long enough, but uh, I'm just... Uh, I just like talking to you, brother. I, I know mean, this, this is fun. Like, this, like I, I say it every time. I mean it with all my heart. Like lit highlight of my week. I'm so excited! I've been looking forward to this since we scheduled it, and uh, I can't wait. So, on that note, Rudy, get everybody out of here. For the Barrel Roller, I'm the Swamp Fox, and we want to thank you for support for three seasons, and we look forward to your continued support for season four, and we will also want to tell you to keep it station to station, and we'll see you out in the field.